All right. So first, I want to thank the uh, American Society of Comparative Law for including this panel. I want, also want to thank my fabulous, fabulous panelists. It's been just over three years since rape and sexual assault allegations against Harvey Weinstein sparked a movement that has reverberated around the globe. This panel considers the history of addressing, or not, sexual violence in the U.S. and other countries to in interrogate whether and to what extent the hashtag MeToo movement has been or has the potential to be transformative. Brenda Hostman, the Goodman Skipper Professor of Law at, Toronto, at University of Toronto will begin by discussing the intergenerational contestation among feminists about addressing sexual violence to help us frame the issues. Then Terry McMurtry Chubb, Professor of Law at UIC John Marshall Law School will draw on her experience co-drafting the letter opposing the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to discuss social movements and their ability to result in political change. I will then talk about how hashtag MeToo has played out in Italy, focusing on the role that the Italian Supreme Court has taken in recent years to debunk rape myths. And to close out the panel, Penelope Andrews, Professor of Law at New York Law School, will uh, discuss general themes about how hashtag MeToo in the global north has played out in the global south, particularly in South Africa. We will keep our remarks to about 12 to 15 minutes, uh, and I've got a timer, um, and then we will open for questions and discussion. Feel free to use the chat for, uh, for questions or just unmute and, uh, and ask your questions when we're done. So I will now turn it over to Brenda, thank you. Rachel, um, the way that I have my notes, I'm not actually gonna be able to see you. So when you're gonna give me my little warning, could you just like literally interrupt and just say it? That would be fantastic. Um, and I am now going to try to share my screen. Um, every time I go to do this, it feels like magic if it actually works, but I think it has actually worked. Okay, so, um, so my uh, talk today is based on a book that I've just uh, basically completed called Me Too, Sex Wars 2.0 and the Regulation of Sexual Harm. And um, I come at the question of Me Too uh, from uh, interested in the debates between and amongst feminists about its strategies, its discourses, and its implications. So Me Too uh, achieved its greatest feminist consensus at its most general iteration. Sexual assault and sexual harassment are bad and pervasive. Uh, the more monstrous the behavior, the greater the consensus. Harvey Weinstein could emerge and did emerge as the consensus villain. Um, you know, this is about the only image I can stand looking at of him um, because it's all covered up really. Um, but so he really could emerge as this kind of consensus villain. But the problem was is that the further Me Too moved away um, from this archetype of the sexual predator, the more the consensus faded. There started to be a few dissenting feminist voices in the fall of 2017, particularly in relation to allegations against Senator Al Franken. And concerns began to be articulated about Me Too going too far, um, whatever that meant, although it seemed to mean two things. One, that too much sexual conduct was captured and or with too little due process. Now, there were a number of articulations of this um, that began to build a little bit in the press. It exploded a little bit with the Catherine Deneuve letter, for example, in France. Um, but this feminist disagreement would really explode with the publication of the Aziz Ansari story in babe.net um, in January of 2018. Now, the article in babe.net told the story of a 20 something young woman by the name of a pseudonym of Grace, who went on a date with Ansari, where he repeatedly initiates sex despite her request to slow down. She eventually leaves in tears and comes to understand her experience as a form of sexual assault. The feminist public sphere, the blog sphere just exploded um, in the aftermath of this. It was a story that resonated with many um, particularly young millennial women, though not exclusively so, um, while other feminists denounced it as trivializing of Me Too and the really important work that Me Too was doing around sexual assault and so-called serious sexual harassment. This was a debate that was very quickly framed as generational. 
as uh, as millennials versus um, sorry, I'm just trying to change my slide. Millennials versus second wave feminists, and it got pretty nasty pretty quickly. Um, Katie Way, uh, who was the author of the Aziz Ansari story in Babe.net. Uh, famously called CNN anchor Ashley Banfield a quote, burgundy lipstick, bad highlights, second wave feminist has been. Younger feminists started to blame second wave feminists for, well, pretty much everything. Um, and second wave feminists were started to tell younger feminists, millennial feminists to grow up and effectively learn to call an Uber. It was game on and it was really nasty. Now this generational narrative, um, in, in my mind, neither um, is neither accurate nor explanatory of the underlying disagreements. And what I do in my work is to argue instead that the feminist debates that were articulated here um, are actually part of a long history of feminist disagreement. Feminist disagreement that goes all the way back to the sex wars of the 1970s and the 1980s and are being repeated in what I now call Sex Wars 2.0 being played out largely in relation to sexual assault and sexual harassment, particularly, not exclusively, but particularly in terms of campus uh, sexual violence. So this, the original sex wars in a kind of grossly oversimplified Wikipedia uh, version were feminist disagreements over sexuality, agency, and the role of law, particularly though not exclusively in relation to pornography. Uh, on one side were radical feminists uh, who saw sexuality as a site of danger, which limits women's agency, if not making it utterly impossible, and which in turn turned to law to redress. On the other side were radical feminists, um, sorry, sex radical feminists, uh, who saw sexuality also as a site of pleasure, who saw women as sexual agents, um, or at least not entirely as sexual victims, and who were also skeptical of the role of law. Now, fast forward to the current iterate uh, to, to Sex Wars 2.0. Um, in its current version, I argue that um, this debate is being played out again. Um, uh, it's being played out. Oh dear, I'm behind in my um, my slides. Uh, it's being played out again in the 2.0 version. Um, on one side, you have the inheritors of radical feminism, uh, who are pushing for stronger laws against sexual violence, including broader definitions, better enforcement, harsher penalties. On the other side are those who worry about broad definitions, as well as the potential overreach of both criminal and civil remedies and the underreach of due process. Um, underlying the sex wars then, both then and now, I think what we see is sexuality as being contested as either a site of danger or pleasure, consent in terms of women as victims or women as agents, and law in terms of more law versus less law. Now, I think that this, um, this very similar debate is what is now happening um, in the context of Me Too. So on the one hand, um, in terms of sexuality, um, Me Too feminists are, I think, the intellectual inheritors of radical feminism. They see sexuality as a site of danger. Um, they're focusing on the pervasiveness of sexual danger in women's lives. The feminist critics, on the other hand, the Me Too detractors, as I call them, um, are the intellectual inheritors of the sex radicals who push back at this idea um, and want to keep space for sexual desire and the ambivalences of sexual attraction in terms of Consent, I think we similarly see uh, these two sides of the sex wars. Me Too feminists seek a broader understanding of consent or maybe more specifically the lack thereof, whereas the feminist critics, the feminist detractors insist on women's agency, that women can and do negotiate sexual relationships. Um, there may be coercion, but there is also agency. Um, and, and I think it's also important to say that, that these are not um, absolute either ors, but they're really a matter of emphasis, um, with nuances often being lost in the reductive caricaturing and name calling, but it really is a matter of emphasis, say the emphasis on women as victims versus the emphasis on women as agents. Now, um, 
uh, so I, I go into some detail in my work trying to illustrate these, these very differences. Now, when it comes to law, and I'm particularly interested in the question of law, um, the debates don't map quite as easily or quite as obviously um, as they did um, in terms of, I think, sexuality and consent. So um, uh, the Me Too did not emerge as a movement with a legal agenda. If anything, I think it actually was a performance of law's spectacular failure. And yet the law casts, I think, a very long shadow over Me Too. In a nutshell, I think Me Too challenged the centrality of law as the exclusive arbiter of sexual violence, um, namely the law's power to both define the harm and then to decide whether or not it exists. Um, the feminist critics, the feminist detractors, on the other hand, worry about the potential abuses that come with this challenge. Um, they worry about um, moving beyond what law says because of the absence then of uh, problems of due process and the problems of who is likely to get captured in this. So, and I think we can see this play out really uh, very well in terms of both the debates, say, around sexual misconduct um, and debates around due process. So in terms of sexual misconduct, um, Me Too feminists talk about, uh, talk about sexual misconduct. Um, and the critics see this as, uh, so for example, like the sexual misconduct of Aziz Ansari. Um, the critics see this as evidence of Me Too going too far. Now, I think that that's a critique that makes sense if, um, and, and really only if, uh, we think that the criminal law or law more generally should occupy the field of sexual harm. The conduct is not illegal, therefore it shouldn't be a sexual harm. Why? Because law has historically defined what a sexual harm is. Yet at the same time, I think many Me Too feminists are not always arguing, some are, uh, but are not always arguing um, that this sexual misconduct should be actionable, but instead that it is worth discussing as a sexual harm. Now that I think is hard to hear precisely because of the power of law. And again, the, the feminist detractors, um, the Me Too detractors then also worry about um, because of the current carceral moment in which we live, any articulation of sexual harm will be interpreted as supporting the expansion of the criminal law. And effectively, I run a very, I run a very similar critique uh, in and around uh, due process. So, um, uh, so in, in a lot of the book, what I do is this, is this mapping of the sex wars then and now onto the debates that are occurring between feminists, between and amongst feminists within the Me Too movement that I think better explains these underlying disagreements than the idea that this is somehow just a generational uh, dispute. Now, this mapping and um, highlighting of feminist investments and stakes, I do ultimately with a view to how things could be otherwise, um, uh, how we actually ought to think about things in different ways. So what I then do in really the second half of the book is try to look at how we might break out of these kind of either or for and against debates of the sex wars and Me Too. How could we approach the regulation of sexual harm differently, taking the harms that each side identifies seriously? Minutes. And here I turn particularly to the work of, got it, um, to the work of Eve Sedgwick on reparative reading and on the idea that we can read claims beside each other as opposed to against each other. Um, and the simplistic way in which I um, uh, actually try to uh, try to explain this is in reference to my bunny and duck um, image. So the idea here is that um, the idea of reading beside is to hold claims beside each other that are sometimes hard to hold onto simultaneously, um, but that we can actually try to hold onto these simultaneously. So the reason I use the bunny and the duck is that you can only actually see one at a time. You can only either see the rabbit or the duck, but you know that the other one is still present. 
And I use that as a way to try to sort of simplify Eve Sedgwick's idea of reparative reading to reimagine how we might um, uh, rethink the regulation of sexual harm. And there are lots of ways these days that um, many feminist folks are starting to, to try to rethink things, uh, say in relation to restorative justice, there's a lot of writing around that now. I'm trying to think it um, through this, through the lens of reparative reading and to think then what, what kind of a justice model that might produce as a mode of regulation that wouldn't be based on retribution, punishment, um, incarceration, but instead on accountability and responsibility. Um, and that we can think about new modalities of regulation that can recognize the complexities of harm and agency and the limitations of the tool that we work with um, in the spirit of reparative reading of holding the claims of both sides of the sex wars then and now, both sides of Me Too in view simultaneously. Um, and I think I'm 45 seconds under. So I'll stop there. Excellent, thank you so much. And I'm just trying to get out of the yep. stop share. We'll turn it over to Terry. Thank you very much. So I am going to share my screen as well. And I promise I will talk about Justice Kavanaugh, but I'm gonna talk about Justice Kavanaugh through the lens of Rosa Parks. <laughs> so my portion of the presentation I've titled The Centrality of Gender Justice to Civil and Human Rights Lessons from Rosa Parks. So Rosa Parks was politicized in 1931 at the age of 18 when Roy Wright, Eugene Williams, Roy Wright was 12, Eugene Williams was 13, Willie Robertson, 16, Ozzie Powell, 16, Alan Montgomery, 17, Haywood Patterson, 18, Charlie Weems, 19, Andy Wright, 19, and Clarence Norris, 19, collectively known as the Scottsboro Boys, were arrested and charged with rape, a capital offense, on accusations by two white women, Victoria Price, age 21, and Ruby Bates, 17, that a group of black teenagers had raped them. The two were examined by a doctor who found no evidence that either had been raped. Rather, the Scottsboro boys were arrested, the young women were taken to the jail where they positively identified the boys behind bars as their attackers. Having barely escaped being lynched while waiting trial, all of the boys were found guilty at their respective trials and sentenced to death. The sole exception was Roy Wright at age 12 when the jurors at his trial were split seven to five in favor of the death penalty. Their story was national news, especially in the black press where outrage led to action, intervention and a flurry of appeals and retrials and later posthumous pardons and pardons for the men who were still alive. Ruby Bates, one of the, four, or one of the two girls who accused the boys later admitted that her accusations were false. In her words, the Scottsboro boys were framed by the bosses of the South and two girls. I was one of the girls and I want you to know that I'm sorry I said what I did at the first trial, but I was forced to say it. I want, you to, tell, I want to tell you here and now, she said, that I am sorry that I caused them all this trouble. And now I am willing to join hands with black and white to get them free. 13 years later, Reese Taylor, 24, a black woman, wife to Willie Guy Taylor and mother to Joyce Lee, was abducted at gun and knife point by seven white men, Hugo Wilson, Herbert Lovett, Dillard York, Billy Howerton, Luther Lee, Joe Culpepper, and Robert Gamble. She was driven to a remote location and gang raped. At the time of her abduction, Taylor was on her way home from Rock Hill Holiness Church in Abbeville, Alabama with, fe with fellow parishioner Fanny Daniel, who was 61, and her son West, 18. None of these men were arrested or charged, despite being positively identified by Reese, the Daniels, 
and subsequently by Hugo Wilson, one of the rapists himself, who admitted that the men, including himself, abducted and had sex with Reese. However, Wilson claimed that Reese consented to sex with the men and received payment for it. The men threatened to kill Reese if she told, and they tried to kill and intimidate her family in the days, weeks, and months after the rape because she did tell, and the woman she told was Rosa Parks. Parks continued to monitor the Scottsboro trial and to channel her rage into the acquisition of rights for Black Americans. After marrying Raymond Parks at 19, the two began challenging voter disenfranchisement laws and organizing through hosting Voters League meetings in 1940s Alabama. In 1943, a 30-year-old Parks was elected branch secretary to the Montgomery NAACP. It was in this role that she became both the keeper and the herald of Recy Taylor's story. She was the principal investigator for the case, and brought the NAACP's considerable resources to Reese's aid. Most significantly, Rosa Parks leveraged her relationships across gender and professions to place the common occurrence of white men raping black women at the center of the fight for civil rights. So what Parks did was rather extraordinary. In her work as the uh, NAACP, she was able to organize uh, across workers unions, across the military, and they all put pressure on the governor of Alabama, the Alabama legislature, and the governor in the county where Reese was raped to bring this case to trial and to have a, um, a, a real trial. Um, in the trial that occurred, it wasn't even a trial, a grand jury was convened and none of the men were arrested and none of them uh, were witnesses. Um, so it wasn't really a trial. So I pulled this newspaper article here so you can see an example of um, some of the press that was going out nationwide. Parks understood that gender violence is integral to maintaining interlocking systems of white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, and imperialism. While Me Too gained momentum in the U.S. across racial lines, the grassroots, uh, the, the grassroots organizing by the originator of the term, Tarana Burke, was eclipsed by Hollywood's bright lights, the irresistible narrative of movie stars taking on powerful men. Had the focus remained on the daily sexual violence suffered disproportionately by black and brown women and girls that Tarana Burke and other women like her have devoted their lives to address, hashtag Me Too may have created enough momentum to surface and bring a demolition ball down on patriarchy. Instead, white supremacy operated to polarize women along racial lines, the age old battle between white feminism and black feminism, which left black women still licking our wounds from Anita Hill when we were called upon to support Christine Blasey Ford in opposing the nomination of now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. When Blasey Ford brought allegations of sexual assault against Brett Kavanaugh, law professors began chatting on our various listservs about, he, about how we could possibly support her. Many of us believed that it was necessary to oppose Kavanaugh uh, to support Blasey Ford because of the damage he could cause in our profession by his example and both societally in his role uh, as a Supreme Court Justice. On the Women in Legal Education listserv, which is hosted by the American Association of Law Schools, an ad hoc group convened to write a letter by women law professors in opposition to Brett Kavanaugh. We thought that it was important that women write this letter, and our drafting group reflected racial diversity and diversity of academic rank and type. Law professors who teach legal writing and run clinics were also included. Soon, male law professors heard about the letter and wanted to know why they could not be drafters or signatory to our letter. We explained our reasons again and encouraged them to write their own letter as men. Instead, they hijacked the process. They called their powerful contacts at the New York Times and secured a front page for their letter, free of charge. They also excluded as signatories contingent faculty, the majority of whom are women. So they said, you can't sign if you don't have a kind of a permanent academic appointment. So 
excluding, effectively excluding um, clinicians and professors of legal writing. This male authored letter garnered the attention of the national press, while our women authored letter received less press. The only television coverage we received was from the Canadian press. So thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Organizing around hashtag me too in this instance highlighted fractures in our community. It put a spotlight on our inability to organize and build coalitions with an understanding of multiple interlocking oppressions. So you can see uh, some of the press, the Hill, 900 female law professor, law school faculty, uh, professor signed letter opposing Kavanaugh and then this is the New York Times on the other side. The Senate should not confirm Kavanaugh signed 2,400 plus law professors. In the beginning of the coverage, we were following it. Um, the press was rolling our numbers into the numbers for the New York Times. So they weren't actually giving us credit for our letter, but they were counting all of the, the um, uh, numbers together. And now our failure to uh, bring the wrecking ball down on patriarchy is patriarchy's predictable response. This is uh, Amy Coney Barrett uh, being sworn in for her Senate confirmation hearing. I thought these images were striking. Here you have Amy Coney Barrett being sworn in and here you have Christine Blasey Ford testifying against Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, they're in the same position, but in two very different situations. So in closing, um, hashtags can amplify grassroots movements and facilitate coalition building, but on their own, they're not sustainable to do either. In the case of Me Too, white supremacy shrouded Toronto Burke's work and the organizing that could unite us and start a revolution. So we had this, this, um, this social media um, a flurry that you know resulted in women speaking out, but the women who were highlighted were those women who were you know movie stars, rich and powerful. I don't know that we did much with Me Too um, to surface the concerns of everyday women dealing with sexual violence. Um, Rosa Parks knew better, and so maybe now we do too. Thank you. Thank you. So I do not have a PowerPoint. Um, I'll go ahead and start. It is quite clear that the hashtag MeToo movement in Italy, hashtag Quella Volta Che, that time when, has gained little to no traction. The editor of the Libro declared, first these women gave it away, then 20 years later they repent and denounce the alleged rapist. And if they gave it away in exchange for a part in a movie, that's a form of prostitution. Indeed, similar scorn um, has been unleashed against Italian-born actress Asia Argento after she reported that she was sexually assaulted by Harvey Weinstein, uh, so much so that she left the country. After 10 women accused Italian director Fausto Brizzi of molesting them, the backlash in the media was again severe. Italy has not seen even a handful of high-profile public accusations. Why is this? Certainly historic and entrenched attitudes about women and sexual violence persist in Italy. Deeply patriarchal attitudes remain. I will discuss the Italian Supreme Court Cassazione opinions that refute some of these rape myths, including the relevance of what the victim was wearing, relevance of the appearance of the victim, or conduct of the victim such as driving home with the alleged rapist, and the attitude that women are sexual objects available to men. Before Italy's reform of sexual violence laws, and even for a while after, the Italian Supreme Court of Cassazione reflected patriarchal attitudes and further reinforced ancient rape myths and stereotypes. From the infamous Jeans case, in which the court had concluded that the victim must have consented to intercourse because everyone knows that tight-fitting jeans are difficult to remove, without the assistance of the person wearing them, to a case in which the court upheld a reduction in punishment for a man who sexually assaulted his 14-year-old stepdaughter because the victim admitted that she engaged in sexual relations with others and thus was not seriously harmed. More recently, however, Cassazione has devoted significant attention in a number of opinions to debunking and rejecting arguments grounded in rape myths. 
For example, the court has declared emphatically and repeatedly that the fact that the victim was wearing jeans is not a defense to charges of sexual violence. It is not a basis for concluding that the victim must have consented. In other cases, defendants have argued that an accuser should not be believed because she arranged the get together where the alleged rape occurred or that she let the alleged rapist drive her home. The court has rejected these types of facts, that these types of facts are sufficient to conclude that the victim should not be believed. Just last year, the court reversed a court of appeal decision which had absolved two defendants in a gang rape case despite their conviction in the court of first instance. The court of appeal relied on the fact that the victim had arranged the evening get together with the defendants and others, that she had remained to drink with the defendants after others had left. The appellate panel also discounted medical evidence that the victim had been given a date rape drug. Furthermore, the panel pointed to the masculine features of the victim to conclude that she must not have been sexually assaulted. This case made headlines for this aspect, as well as the fact that the appellate panel was made up of three women judges, demonstrating just how entrenched rape myths are. In reversing the panel court, the appellate court, Cassazione made clear that neither the appearance of the victim nor the actions she took in arranging the get together were relevant in evaluating her credibility, such as to reverse the trial court's conviction of the defendant, thus debunking the myth that only feminine looking or attractive women may be raped or that a victim is somehow at fault for going out and drinking with men. In addition, in cases involving sudden forced and unwanted kisses, Cassazione opinions illustrate a sharp contrast with earlier evaluations of these incidents. While it may seem trivial to focus on sudden and forced kisses, the hashtag MeToo movement has revealed these to be more common and more harmful than previously recognized. We've seen a number of high profile allegations of men placing their lips on a woman in sudden and forceful ways that prevent her from avoiding this contact. In addition, we have seen that there are several similar reports regarding the same men. At least eight allegations of such conduct have been leveled against former CBS executive Les Moonves, and there have been at least 19 such allegations against President Trump. Women have reported that these incidents have been humiliating, invasive, and intimidating. Thus, this conduct is neither rare nor trivial. The opinions of Cassazione which address this conduct are also informative of how the court has been discrediting the idea that women are sexual objects available to men. By way of background, before the 1996 reform, Italian law distinguished between violent carnal intercourse and violent acts of lust. In addition, the law defined these offenses as ones against public morals and decency rather than crimes against the person. That means that the law was not intended to protect the victim, but family honor and societal decency. In a case decided shortly before the 96 reform went into effect, Cassazione reversed a conviction for violent acts of lust of an employer who kissed the neck and cheek of his employee. The court described this as a fleeting kiss, which did not harm public morals. The court pointed to the prevalence of quote unquote red light movies and billboard advertisements displaying intimate body parts and young people kissing and hugging in public to conclude that in postmodern society, kisses other than those on the mouth or erogenous zones have lost their immodest character. The court pointed to the fact that women have full equality and work side by side with men in the workplace. According to the court, the definition of violent acts of lust must also be modernized to include only those touches that unequivocally manifest sexual desire and thrill, implying that this is the price women must pay for equality. The 1996 reform repealed the prior crimes of carnal intercourse and violent acts of lust and now defines sexual violence as whoever by violence or threats or abuse of authority compels another to do or submit to sexual acts shall be imprisoned from five to 10 years. In addition, this law is now categorized within, the crime, within crimes against the person and reflects the intention to protect the sexual autonomy of victims. Another provision does allow for a reduction of the sentence in um, less serious instances. Following the enactment of this reform in a 1998 decision involving another workplace incident in which the employer held the victim's shoulders, pulled her toward him, repeated the word amore, and tried to kiss her mouth. 
However, she turned her head and he kissed her cheek. The court focused on the 96 changes in the law to protect victim sexual autonomy and rejected the argument that the fleeting kiss did not exhibit lustful intentions. The court also explained how cases are to be evaluated in context, considering all of the circumstances involved, that this occurred in the workplace, um, that there was an employer-employee relationship, and the like. Italian scholars immediately lamented um, the court's definition of including these types of quote unquote stolen kisses as sexual acts and have continued to critique the court and lament how uh, these cases have taken up so much time and um, judicial energy. They say that only quote unquote profound kisses on the mouth or erogenous zone should constitute sexual acts. Many of these scholars argue that an unwanted kiss is likely to arise in too many ambiguous situations, subjecting men uh, who make bumbling passes to criminal conviction. Nonetheless, Cassazione has rejected these calls, unusual in a legal system rooted in the civil law tradition, which typically gives the opinions of scholars, known as la doctrina, significant weight. Instead, Cassazione has recognized that depending on the context and circumstances, a sudden, forceful, and unwanted kiss may amount to more than a bumbled pass, and has rejected arguments rooted in attitudes that a defendant believes the victim would welcome such con contact. Uh, in a 2006 case involving a police chief who ordered his female subordinate to drive to a secluded area with a panoramic view, he grabbed her and tried to kiss her. When she struggled and pushed him away, he held her arms and kissed her on the neck. Cassazione affirmed his conviction for sexual violence, not because his conduct offended societal decency, but because it infringed on the sexual autonomy of the victim. She unambiguously demonstrated that she did not want him to kiss her. Cassazione did not accept the defendant's argument that he thought his advances would be welcome. Similarly, in a 2015 decision, uh, the court devoted considerable analysis of the facts involving a doctor who walked into a break room of a nursing home, strode up to a nurse who was sitting at a table, and suddenly and forcefully kissed her on the lips. The doctor claimed that he and the nurse had worked together for several years, and he was simply greeting her with affection. The court set out the testimony of both the victim and others, which demonstrated that the two had a cordial working relationship, but had never greeted each other with any kind of kiss, much less one on the mouth. The court again emphasized the importance of considering the full context of the situation, as well as the harm to the sexual autonomy of the victim. The court rejected the defendant's belief that the nurse would have welcomed his kiss, or that he was somehow entitled to kiss her on the lips, given how long they had worked together. More recently, in 2019, the court considered an appeal from a defendant convicted of suddenly kissing the victim on the lips at a gym after tricking her into covering her eyes. The defendant claimed he kissed the victim only because he believed that she would not reject this, and that as soon as she demonstrated her disapproval, he backed away. In affirming the conviction, the court described the defendant's argument as one of presuming compliance of the victim. The court considered evidence about interactions between the two before and after this incident. Defendant had made numerous advances and even threatening comments such as, I'm just asking you to coffee, it's not like I'm going to rape you, and evidence of the victim unequivocally and repeatedly rebuffing uh, his comments. After kissing the victim, the defendant cautioned her not to tell anyone and then suggested that he join her in the changing room. The court rejected the defendant's argument that he reasonably presumed the victim would submit to his kiss. Outside of the context of sudden enforced kisses, the court has issued other opinions which debunk rape myths. I mentioned the cases declaring that genes are no defense, the case from last year reversing a court of appeal decision which pointed to the masculine appearance of the victim. In addition, in an opinion issued earlier this year, the court discredited other arguments based on rape myths. Um, involving the behavior of the victim following the rape and the lack of any physical evidence that the victim had resisted. One incident occurred in the gym where they both worked. The defendant picked the victim up and placed her on a small bed in the changing room, effectively preventing her from resisting and held her down with the weight of his body. Subsequently, the, the defendant drove the victim home. Cassazione emphasized that this fact is not a basis for doubting the credibility of the victim. The court discussed how, as a result of the stress of sexual assault, it is not appropriate to discount the victim's rape allegations based on this fact. In addition, the court faulted the trial court for reaching this conclusion despite the presence of other evidence corroborating the victim's account, results of a medical exam, and the testimony of close friends in whom she confided after the sexual assault. 
The court also rejected the classic argument that since the victim had no bruises or scratches, the intercourse must have been consensual. So was all of this work by Cassazione paying off? Is it changing attitudes? It's hard to tell. Given the predominantly conservative nature of most of the Italian media, the cases that tend to get the most press are not the ones I've discussed. Also, as I've stated, a number of scholars continue to critique the court for many of these opinions um, that interrogate arguments by lower courts, which display the continued influence and power of rape myths. However, the case that I just described um, involving the rape in the gym by the victim's co-workers, it was the appellate court that reversed the trial court's conclusions regarding the victim's credibility. In addition, in a recent pretrial proceeding of two Italian carabinieri for raping two American tourists, the women were questioned about whether they were wearing underwear, whether they drank after the alleged rape, and whether they are attracted to men who wear uniforms. The judge did not allow these questions and at one point said, I have no intention of returning to the trials of 50 years ago. In conclusion, Cassazione's work in refuting ancient rape myths began before the hashtag MeToo movement. While these myths persist, the court's work is having some impact, perhaps only within the judiciary in Italy, and perhaps the hashtag MeToo movement can provide additional support for the recent work of Cassazione. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you to my co-panelists um, and to you in the audience still listening to us. Um, I know uh, as the last speaker, I need to um, uh, try and be as um, brief as I can so that we can move on to questions and comments. And I thought instead of reading my paper, I would talk to you about this paper, which is part of a larger project that I'm engaged in. Um, which attempts to look at um, the hashtag MeToo movement in the context of transnational movements for gender equality um, and whether MeToo is actually central or marginal to those movements. So my, I focus on South Africa because the work that I've done in South Africa on violence against women very much fits into this. And also I see MeToo as part of the continuum, it's just a, the, the continual work and the continual anti-violence project of the feminist movement. I agree with Brenda that hashtag me too is a vivid illustration of the failure of law to comprehensively and decisively deal with the problem of violence against women. Um, I was also interested, um, foc uh, focusing on this, I was interested in the initial muted response to hashtag MeToo in South Africa. Um, although South Africa has always, particularly in the last decade or two, there have been uh, persistent campaigns um, on violence against women. And so I'm interested in, in looking at the meaning of MeToo, the relevance of MeToo, why the initial muted response. And in fact, I argue that there's a way in which hashtag me too has some relevance, but uh, uh, there are some, some significant differences. So in my paper, I begin by sort of describing how um, feminist advocates, uh, uh, women, anti-violence advocates in South Africa watched events unfolding in the United States after uh, Melissa uh, Alano sent out her tweet. And there was a sense that there was this uh, uh, outpouring of support for women, very, very powerful men uh, were dismissed, lost their jobs, publicly shamed, et cetera, et cetera. And a country like South Africa, where there's such enormous um, statistics on violence against women, the idea was that certainly some powerful men would be affected some way because of, you know, widespread knowledge about the misbehavior and uh, misogyny uh, in South Africa, particularly amongst the ruling party uh, and so on and other, the, in, the business sector, etc. But that did not transpire. So my lines of inquiry really in South Africa is the first is I'm looking at this question of revisiting the question of gender equality 
In the context of decolonization and anti-racism, Terry mentioned the racial dynamic which in which Me Too is embedded. Um, and so part, this is part of a larger exploration as well. I'm comparing what I see as a the durability as it were, and maybe more support for Black Lives Matter as, compo as opposed to Me Too and even in South Africa. So I'm, I'm looking at that. Um, I'm looking at the fact that the race question is that in South Africa, race has always been seen as a, sort of a primary, the, it, certainly the eradication of racism has taken priority over the eradication of um, um, sexism and patriarchy. And that's a struggle, that's a continual struggle. Um, in one a paper I wrote a long time ago, I wrote about um, sort of uh, eradication of sexism and, and, and women's liberation being the stepchild of national liberation. It still plays out. And in fact, uh, Brenda's um, comments about a sort of um, intergenerational narrative. There's also an intergenerational narrative being played out in South Africa, and that is that older women who were part of the liberation movement saw themselves not so much as feminists, but as anti-racist and anti-apartheid activists. And when they actually went into government, did not necessarily, even though rhetorically they did prioritize gender equality, but nation building took precedence over gender equality. So that is uh, uh, one of my lines of inquiry. I also look at the failure of law in the context of South Africa's constitution, which is one of the most progressive and one of the most comprehensive legal mechanisms for redressing violence against women and gender equality. I won't go into all the provisions of the South African constitution, but many of you are aware of the transformative possibility of the constitution, the a range of rights in, in, embedded in the constitution, the way that the constitutional project is really, really seen as transformative, very, very different from the American constitutional project, for example. Um, and so I uh, uh, interrogate that as well. I look at the jurisprudence of the South African Constitutional Court, which also provides, certainly formally, a great space uh, with which to pursue um, anti-violence campaigns because the jurisprudence of the Constitutional Court has for the most part been um, a, a progressive around gender equality and certainly been uh, quite strident from my perspective on violence against women. The court's judgments have been um, fairly expansive with respect to the way it's interpreted, for example, common purpose, where a group of people, um, um, a gang rape, for example, a context which has usually uh, normally been used in the political context, et cetera, the way that the South African uh, Constitutional Court has interpreted um, um, equality, a substantive version as opposed to a mere formal one, which was also imported to a large extent from uh, Canada, um, from Canadian constitutional jurisprudence. Um, I also look at, um, uh, obviously, my line of inquiry, I, I start with South Africa, but I'm particularly interested in the way that hashtag me too plays out in transnational movements, particularly global South movements, in which questions around indigenous law, indigenous institutions, which have, which regulate the lives of people at a very, very, very personal level, at a local and personal level, how that plays out. And then of course, I, I revisit this, um, uh, this term conditional interdependence, the argument that there is a, we, we should really think about um, a, a, the sort of binary about independence, um, female gender, uh, gendered independence, female independence, and a more communitarian interdependent approach towards uh, gender equality and gender relations. And a lot of that comes out of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Also something that Brenda mentioned, the idea of restorative justice, of different versions of truth, not just forensic truth, but experiential truth 
truth, diagnostic truth, which looks at the subjective experiences of women as a way as well to frame harm, not just a harm that can be uh, 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 sort of shown through specific pieces of evidence, but taking into account the subjective experience of women. Um, and then I, I sort of look at the generation, particularly in the last few years, looking at the anti-colonial movement in South Africa, particularly um, hashtag roads must fall, and a lot of the movements around decolonization. And then the immediately in the wake of Roads Must Fall, um, the organization by women under patriarchy must fall as a, as a, 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 a direct response to the deep, deep sexism and patriarchy in Roads Must Fall in these movements. And so certainly for a um, this generation of feminists, particularly the women at universities and so on, they're not necessarily tethered to the idea of national liberation in the way that the anti women in the anti-apartheid movement were and so on. And then um, I want to just briefly touch on what I think of as the reasons, and I, I certainly would like to explore this more, but sort of the initial research that suggests that the reasons why um, there was such a muted response to hashtag Me Too in South Africa, considering the ubiquitous nature of violence against women in South Africa, and the fact that the record is clear um, about um, uh, very, very powerful men, including the former president of South Africa who was charged um, and then acquitted of rape. So I, I sort of I list a range of reasons which I explore um, in the paper uh, that responds to the question uh, that with the shocking statistics on gender-based violence, why has the hashtag Me Too movement not caught on in the way that it has in the United States, just a straight uh, comparison. And these are, uh, you know, initially superficial impressions. And then I try and, you know, go uh, um, sort of remove some of it and try and go in, into a more multi-layered analysis. So the first reason I think is, is that uh, race, race is central uh, um, from my perspective. The first, once Harvey Weinstein, and you saw this public denunciation of figures, the first man who was publicly denunciated in South Africa um, is a very, very prominent member of the ruling party and president of the South African Cric uh, uh, Sports Council. His accuser, he's a black South African, his accuser is a white woman also a prominent South Africa, also a former parliamentarian. And she alleged that he had raped her in a hotel room some years before when they were both parliamentarians. And what was very, very interesting was that nobody came forward to support her. And in, 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 in all of it, it's clear that the fact that she's a white woman accusing a black man, there was just too much history in South Africa about white women accusing black men, sometimes without reason. Um, and, you know, the death penalty, the same as in the United States, the death penalty used against black men who were accused of rape. So that, that history loomed large. So I think race is front and central as a reason. The second is, is that the uh, hashtag Me Too movement in the United States was largely seen as being driven by celebrities or celebrities t gave a lot of oxygen to the movement. And so I think that there was this notion that the, the uh, status of you know, celebrities and in, sort of wealthy individuals, media people, um, that those were prioritized over the voices of poorer women who didn't have the kinds of public profiles and so on, and that the poor and marginalized were not represented in all of this. So again, this was that, that um, the idea was that the risks to uh, poorer women, um, particularly their economic, the economic vulnerabilities they have, their social vulnerabilities and so on, 
outweigh the benefits for them of speaking out against sexual violence. The third is the, just the questions around poverty and the pervasive nature of violence against women in South Africa, and that it just seemed trifling to individualize these cases in the way that um, violence plays out in South Africa. Um, as I said, the statistics are, are quite alarming. Um, so, and then the other uh, issue was the hashtag, which Terry had, had mentioned, sort of does the hashtag mean popular movement in South Africa where there's such widespread poverty and technology, access to technology is so limited, a sort of a, a movement um, a hashtag movement has very, very difficult, different sort of uh, connotations. Um, so this ubiquitous nature, the, the, the sort of, this is a weighty reason, as well as the question of poverty and so on. Then the, another reason which I, um, I also explore um, has to do around the meanings of cultural norms. And I'm using the term very, very broadly here. Um, there are, what, what, what is seen as cultural practices and without the cultural lens could be seen as sexual harassment and could be seen as violence against women. And so there are certain practices um, um, that are seen as, in, in, for example, in, in, in traditional Zulu culture, one of the ways in which the groom um, may um, um, uh, uh, so the groom may engage with the family of the bride and with the bride herself um, is to capture, to capture the bride. And some people see this as kidnapping and, and there's a huge discussion about this. Uh, yeah. So the uh, practices that is, is, that is pervasive. See you, Rachel, two minutes. Um, the other is, is that there's just not faith in the police and institutions of society to really deal with it. There's a sense that in the United States, if claims are made that there's a layer of institutional um, um, uh, actors will follow up, whether it's the police, whether it's the, uh, uh, the DA, where the prosecuting authorities, et cetera, et cetera, as well as other advocates who will really, certainly in a legal sense, uh, uh, be supportive. Um, and then, the other is, is, is that, as I said, this, this idea about justice. Um, coming out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the idea of punitive justice and shaming is, in, and, and parts of hashtag Me Too is about shaming people. I think that there's a reticence in South Africa to deal with um, justice only in, in a punitive way. And so restorative justice looms very, very large. So those are sort of the, the questions that I address in my paper. This is a sort of lines of inquiry and um, my time is up. So I'll stop there and hopefully we will have some questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you all very much. Excellent presentations. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions right now in the chat but anybody who wants to uh, just unmute and um, ask a question um, please, please feel free, feel free to do so. And if not, then I'll open it up to the panelists um, to ask questions of each other. Well, if there, okay, is anybody? Okay, Liliana, are you talking? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for all the presentation. It, it, it was super interesting. And I have a thank couple of questions. So the first one is that uh, Brenda and Penelope talked about uh, restorative justice. So I would like to uh, uh, listen more thoughts about this idea, uh, about if you see that this can work and uh, how this can work in this kind of context. And uh, the other question that I have is, um, when, I, when I heard Rachel, about the, the jurisprudence or the sentences of the, of the court in Italy, and uh, specifically about sexual harassment, I was thinking that um, sometimes this kind of crime uh, goes against victims, because in the end, for the victim, it's too hard to prove it. 
And for example, in, in my country, in Colombia, um, it's super easy that the aggressor can prove uh, a defamation case or something like that. So I would like to, to hear something about this in the, in the Italian context. And, and regarding South Africa, Penelope, uh, you said the constitutional court in South Africa is very progressive. And um, uh, when, I, when I saw the image of uh, Barrett and uh, like the backlash that this implies, uh, I thought like uh, if um, in South Africa can happen the same. And if uh, the, the power uh, or the authorities can, can have the opportunity to uh, appoint more conservative justices in the South African court in order to uh, have more conservative uh, jurisprudence. And, uh, and my last question, <laughs> it's uh, that um, in, in the presentation of, of Penelope, you, you, sh uh, you said that there are some disadvantages for women victims. For example, for uh, underprivileged victims and poor victims is more difficult to have this kind of um, uh, like visibility in social media. And I, I, I would like to, uh, to hear if, if you have more reflections about the problem, the problems of Me Too for the victims, because uh, many people speak about the problems of due process. But in the end, for victims, it can have uh, many bad, uh, many bad uh, effects, or uh, it can be uh, it can um, become uh, a victimization or something like that. So, thank you. Good questions. Thank Brenda, you, Brenda. You I think Brenda start. Yes. Um, so, uh, sure, I'll jump in. Um, so. Uh, so I make various allusions to restorative justice, um, and this is something that I that I tackle a bit in the last chapter of my book. Um, uh, and I mean, restorative justice now means so many things to so many people. Um, and what I'm interested in, uh, and, and so you know, you can have restorative justice processes that are attached to criminal processes. You could have restorative justice that are separate from criminal law processes. You can have them that are. Uh, supplement to civil law processes, you can have them as completely independent ones. Other folks, um, particularly uh, abolition feminists, are talking more around transformative justice. Now, what I'm interested in is moving away from um, moving away from the criminal, the retributive, the carceral, um, and to think about what are other forms of accountability. And so this is where I'm, I'm very drawn to the work, well, very drawn to the work that Tarana Burke has been doing for a very long time. Um, the work that abolition feminists and, um, and work around transformative justice have been doing for a long time of actually being able to hold simultaneously in view this idea that there is a real harm to sexual violence, but there's a real harm to the way that we've regulated it. So what might it mean to think about um, calling the accused, the perpetrator, the offender to account in ways that are different um, than the way we have thought about it retributively? Um, and carcerally. Um, so when I make references to the restorative, I'm, I'm not actually really saying we should use a restorative justice per se. Um, I'm reviewing some of that literature, but thinking, I think that we can think of ways of calling people to account and taking on responsibility in ways that are going to be actually more responsive to the needs of the victim than what we do right now. Also in ways, and one of the things that I'm really interested in as well is the question of effective justice. Um, what does justice feel like for people who have been harmed? Um, and I think, and that's where, you know, I just, I, I go back so often to Tarana Burke's work because she's all about, um, about the affect of the trauma of sexual harm and finding ways to move through it and beyond it. Um, and so for me, I mean, I mentioned restorative, but I'm really trying to think harder in terms of other modes of accountability that are both going to be better for both the victim and the offender. Thank you, Liliana. Um, I, you know, the, just to your first question about how does restorative justice work, I want to give you an example in South Africa where they actually have incorporated restorative justice 
in the sexual offences area. So there are sexual offences courts that have been set up for child victims of sexual assault because the idea was it's still part of the criminal justice system, the criminal court system, but the idea was that the child and the families of the child, as well as the families of the perpetrator and the perpetrator and themselves need to actually engage and um, try, it's, it's sort of the idea of to repair. To repair, you cannot, a child couldn't possibly be repaired uh, or, uh, by this experience, but some way in which the community and the families are involved. So the sexual offenses court is a model. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think that it's hard to think about rape and restorative justice, but that's a model of restorative justice that's been in South Africa for some time. With respect to the constitutional court, you're absolutely correct. I mean, um, if you look at the first generation of constitutional court judges in South Africa, they were people who their anti-apartheid and liberal and radical credentials were clear. Um, we've had um, you know, three presidents since uh, Nelson Mandela, and particularly the third president was corrupt as all get up, charged with rape, et cetera, et cetera. And he managed to, in almost in a Trumpian way, change so many of the institutions in South Africa, including the judges uh, that have been appointed. So the Constitutional Court and many of the courts, they're still obviously very, you know, men and women with integrity, but there's been a conservatizing that's happened um, in the court. So yeah, but nothing like the South African constitution and the principles in the constitution are of recent vintage. I mean, it's 25, 26 years old. You know, when we talk about originalism, it's there's still the people who were involved in drafting the constitution. So I think it will be, the processes will happen. I agree with you, um, but it may take just a little longer. Um, with respect to poor victims and the problems of Me Too, I think that there is obviously the power and the support and the, for, for women who are survivors of sexual assault, the utterance of Me Too is an empowering act. Um, but it's an, an empowering act in context. It's not an empowering act for many, many women, poor women who live in communities who are dependent on so many people, including spouses and brothers and so on for all kinds of support. So unless you have the network of support, it, it, it in fact has the opposite effect. So that was what I was talking about when I say that the vulnerabilities of poor women are exacerbated and there may not be the space to you know, embark on this this kind of Me Too. And in any case, as I said, um, technology and access to technology is very, is much more limited uh, in South Africa because the high rates of poverty. I hope that was responsive to your question, Liliana. And I'll just add in terms of, uh, in Italy, defamation is, um, is also a, a possible argument made that a defendant can make. I have not studied that, but in one of the cases that I talked about, that was um, something raised by the defendant and um, and it was rejected by the court. But that is certainly um, certainly cause for cause for concern. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up to other to other questions. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Francisco Astudillo. I'm from Mexico. Um, I have a question for, well, thank you for your interesting uh, presentations. Um, well, we have in Mexico uh, has a specific law to prevent uh, violence against women, but from, from the legal aspect, we, we have all the rights in the constitutions, but my question is, is there any other strategies or extra legal strategies to to um, to make like or to to make the to the law to 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 change the culture i mean the the machismo i mean the you know thank you very much yeah i think that's a great question i'll open it up to anyone on the panel who wants to carry yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, you know, again, lessons from Rosa Parks. So, I mean, imagine, you know, Rosa Parks is in the in the deep south. She's in Abbeville, Alabama, when she gets the call that Reese Taylor has been raped, right? And all the, everyone knows who did it. Um, 
And, you know, even the men are admitting we did it. Uh, and so what she was what she was able to do is to build coalitions to put direct pressure on the people who could make change. So one of my favorite stories from what she did is that she actually um, she contacted veterans and active military who had been fighting uh, abroad and she you know the the black press kind of got this word out and so they were reading these papers and, and so you have all these military men writing letters to the governor of Alabama saying well you know if southern uh, womanhood doesn't matter for black women then I guess we're fighting fascism abroad we need to be fighting fascism uh, at home and maybe this war effort is not going to be so successful <laughs> if you're not responsive to what we're trying to do right? <laughs> and so can you imagine as the governor of Alabama like getting these letters <laughs> from the military being like what is this about right and you don't you know and he really doesn't want to be in the press he really doesn't want to be visible. So, I mean, this is one of the things they did, this this mass kind of letter writing campaign. They also had an assault in the press where, you know, the press just did not let up. Um, and, and they had articles that were in every single black publication across the country. So um, they used the journalism, journalism as a vehicle to, to, again, make this visible. You saw um, one of the slides I had that, you know, the, the, the headlines were um, intentionally provocative, right? So people would be like, what's going on with this? And why isn't this happening? Um, and so I think, you know, I always tell when I go to give a, a talk somewhere that, you know, people are institutions, like we make the institutions. And so if we can change how people are viewing things, if we can put it in front of them in a way, in new and creative ways. And now we have so many opportunities um, with the technology that we have at our disposal, but nothing beats, you know, and it's difficult because of the pandemic, but, you know, trying to make connections across, um, co you know, build coalitions, make connections across uh, professions and disciplines and, and, you know, people, I often joke, um, when I was in graduate school, our, our graduate students were the first in the university to unionize, and we unionized with the United Electrical Workers Union. So you can yeah, so you can imagine like all these nerdy history students, and you know we're in like a union rave with the United Electrical Workers Union. <laughs> but uh, it worked, right? And we learned from them. They learned from us, and we were able to do some spectacular things together. So um, that that's what I would. I would say. Francesco, I just want to say that I think your question is key to the question that we face in South Africa with this great constitution and incredible laws, and yet cultural practices just, and it's not just, I, don't, I mean, using culture very, very broadly. Let me just give you an example. Today, today, Somebody sent us, some of us South Africans here in the United States, a video of a man in Johannesburg who was charged uh, some uh, uh, weeks ago with raping his two-year-old and eight-year-old daughter. He was, he applied for bail successfully. Today, he went back to the community from which he came. Of course, the children and the wife were removed. They somewhere else. This man got a hero's welcome. He's a local counselor. He was, he's charged with raping his children. So this is, it's a sort of, the idea is, is that this is so, it's, it, it's so horrendous and, 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 and it's not unusual. As somebody pointed out to me today, look who the United States voted as a president. Uh, somebody who's known to be incredibly, it's not, you know, I'm not talking about comparing him to this individual today, but the same mindset about women and about, you know, the, the sort of attitudes towards women, I think it's very, very hard to change and it requires a multidimensional approach, which has also involves economic status. I do believe that, you know, women's economic choices impact on the ability to pursue dignified lives. Thank you. Brenda, did you wanna? Um, I guess I was just gonna say that, um, you know, I think, I, I think we can almost, we can kind of understand how we've gotten to the place that we've gotten today, um, particularly in terms of, of um, 
uh, American American criminal the, the carceral state that we've gotten to, which is feminists were up against this problem of the like the deeply sexist patriarchal pro violence culture, and the thinking was oh. I know, let's make it a crime because we're gonna do the, mo we're gonna signal as strongly as we can that this is a bad thing in hopes that the law is gonna change the social norms. And, you know, so it's gonna have this deterrent effect but it's gonna have this bigger discursive impact on we're really gonna, you know, start to change behavior. So I think, you know, 30, 40 years later, all we've managed to do is um, do, we haven't changed the culture that much. Um, we have managed to incarcerate disproportionately people of color um, in a way that is just like, just, you know, like horrifying um, in the United States. And, but we haven't actually done anything to change the culture. So it kind of started as this idea that we could use law to change the norms. Um, but, but we haven't very effectively changed the norms. And then there's all these, you know, unintended yet entirely predictable outcomes around who gets punished through a carceral state. So it just sort of, sometimes it just helps me understand, you know, how did we get here in the first place? Why was it that all these feminists supported this in the first place? Like it sort of made sense at the time without thinking through, you know, where this was going to, where this was going to lead us. Um, but it really still keeps coming back to how do you change the culture, right? How do you change the social norms? Um, and, you know, as I, another example I always give, it's like, you know, the only reason that red lights work is because we've all agreed to stop at them. Um, there's not the ability to actually enforce every red light. Um, and so, you know, sexual violence laws are not like red lights, you know, because we haven't agreed to abide by them. Um, and so as a result, we don't have the ability to enforce them. And then we disproportionately enforce them against, um, you know, poor, vulnerable people of color. That was no solution. That was just, you know, an expression of misery. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Are there other questions from the attendees? I wanted to sort of, I wonder if I could pursue with Brenda this. I'm really sort of, I like this revisiting. I can't wait to read your book, Brenda. This revisiting of the, um, the sort of feminists who see sexuality, women's sexuality as liberating, and those who see women's sexuality as threatening. Um, and that Me Too is a, a, a iteration of that particular struggle. I guess the question I have is, is there, is it too naive to consider ways of bridging those two, those opposing perspectives as it were. I don't see it as a continuum. I think it's a different way of looking at women's sexuality. So, you know, I, 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 I think, so this is, you know, part of my, we could read these things beside each other and both can be true, right? It can be true that, um, that for, for women, sexuality continues to be a site of danger. Right? It continues to be produced in ways that it's, it's a site of danger, but that's not all that it is. It is also a site of agency and pleasure and negotiation. And those, they shouldn't be absolutes. They shouldn't be one or the other. And I think that we can actually try to hold those things together as we try to think of ways of re-regulating sexual harm, how we would define what sexual harm is, how we would define sexual harm for the purposes of law, and how we might think about sexual harm that is outside of something that is um, uh, that is actionable, because I think there are also really significant ways. And I think some of the some of the most interesting writing within me too is the idea that you know that 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 there are harms here that are worth talking about in in sexual interactions that fall short of anything that that is or even should be actionable. Um, now, do I think that, you know, Catherine McKinnon and Janet Halley are going to get in a room and sing Kumbaya together? Like, no, that's not going to happen. Um, but I do think that we can find ways to say both of these have important validity. And what can we do if we begin from a position that says they're both really important? Um, how can we build from that? So, I don't know, it's a little, you know, sometimes I feel like it's a little Pollyanna-ish. 
Um, but it's also very much so, so, you know, a lot of the book is also very much a call for um, leaving the wars behind and even leaving the metaphor of wars behind because wars produce enemies, not interlocutors. Um, and we need to find better ways. And also as feminists, we have never been very good at dealing with disagreement because disagreement equals disloyalty equals outrage equals betrayal. Um, and as opposed to saying, well, actually, I disagree with you about this thing and let's try to work that thing through. So, um, so which is also where I'm, I'm kind of all over the place here, but where I'm also becoming more and more interested in the question of effective justice um, around what does justice feel like and what is harm, what do you, you know, what does harm feel like? Um, and what is it that people need to get past that? What do people, what does disagreement feel like? And why do we go so instantly to, you know, outrage and disloyalty as opposed to saying, okay, we disagree. So what does that mean? Um, so some of it is about, so some of what I'm writing is really about the need for feminists to put down their arms in some way um, and to suggest that we can, you know, maybe instead of immediately going, you are wrong and you are my enemy is, well, maybe you have a point. Um, and to try to think about what would it mean if for you to have a point, it doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean you give up everything that you think, but what would, and I just, I, I don't know, I, I have this, this Pollyanna-ish view that this can actually help complicate our analyses of the nature of the sexual harm and the problems that come with the regulation of sexual harm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a problem as well. It's not just feminists, ideologues. Yeah. As yeah. Well, find it hard to find common ground to, you know. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask uh, Terry and Liz, somebody else had a question. So Terry, I wonder if I could ask you about uh, Judge Comey Barrett and what, uh, apart from the fact that her philosophy, her judicial philosophy seems so absolutely the opposite of Judge Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg. What is the, the, the sort of for you other, uh, 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 the symbolic uh, um, appointment of, apart from the substantive problems, but symbolically, what does it mean for, for feminism, for women's identity? Um, and for women's solidarity. Well, I remember being a, a teenager when Justice Thomas was uh, appointed to the, the court. And I remember- See, that, may just me feel, that just made me feel so good, but thank you. <laughs> You're, you are really, really, really old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I was watching with my dad and I remember my dad saying to me, I would remember being outraged and I remember talking, look, look, and I remember the point where I became outraged when he said, you know, I refuse to teach my son that anything having to do with Brownie Board of Education has anything to do with today. And I remember that that sentence just made me apoplectic. And I remember looking at my father and saying, can you believe this? And my father said to me, well, think about it. Um, George Bush is, is in a win-win situation. If he gets nominated, he can say, I nominated a black man to the Supreme Court. And if he does it, he can say, well, <laughs> he was, you know, he, he sexually assaulted <laughs> this woman. Um, and then I remember asking my father, I said, do you think he believes what he's saying? And my father was like, maybe it's just a strategy for him to get on the court. And then he'll like to totally turn into Thurgood Marshall when he gets on. And I said, I don't think that's going to happen. And lo and behold, here we are. And I, so, you know, I've been, it's so difficult for me to process my feelings about Amy Comey Barrett, because all I really feel right now is rage. And to me, it is the, the same feeling I felt watching Justice Thomas. It's like, who is this? You know, he's in a win-win situation. Like he, he elects this, he nominates this person. If she gets nominated, then all the women who voted for him are going to be like, finally, a woman who represents us. And if she doesn't get uh, uh, if she doesn't pass through the nomination. Affirmed. Uh, mm -hmm. Affirmed, yes, thank you. Um, then 
no harm, no foul. We still managed to pack the federal courts and, you know, appoint some justices in any way. And so symbolically, I just think she represents all that. It's like she's the receptacle, the image of all that is po- the, the rhetoric of what's wrong with women, <laughs> what's wrong with uh, women having autonomy, having agency, having a say. Like she is the image of this is how we're going to fix this because this is something that's so wrong. Um, and, you know, when I look at her, all I can see is a handmaid's tale. Like all I can see is this dystopic vision of America. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it just really disturbs me on so many different levels that I don't even really have the language to, to describe it all because I'm still processing it very much. But for me, that image of her getting sworn in and Christine Blasey Ford being subject to, you know, what she was subject to and Anita Hill being subject to what she was subject to, um, the juxtaposition of those images, I think, says it all. Mm. So uh, un- related and unrelated to that. So sometimes you think, you know, watching the news and watching this, you can't get any more outraged than you already are, right? Like we've hit maximum outrage. And yet the next day, you know, you find a new level of outrage. For me, that moment of outrage came in a very maternal moment um, when she talked about her children and she talked about how smart her white biological children are and how nice her black adopted children are they're kind of they're kind of nice and i just i reached a level of i'm I'm an adopted mother i reached a level of i i really think i'm actually going to break the tv right now like i actually can't and and it's so interesting because that came through like as if i don't hate her so much um and everything she stands for and trump and everything but there was something that came down through a slightly problematic ideology of motherhood um, and a kind of, for me, an essentializing an ideology of motherhood that you can't talk like that about your children that somehow took me to a different level of outrage. Anyway, it just, yeah. It, and it, so it, that also feels complicated, right? It's like, why is what she's saying about her kids any more important than what she's actually saying about, you know, abortion and originalism and yada, yada. But that one just sent me over the top. Um. Adrian just put something there. I just want to do a shout out as well. I mean, I know the people in the audience I know who have done interesting work um, on gender equality, but I want to do a shout out for Adrian Wing, whose work on um, gender equality I've often referenced. And uh, so thank you, Adrian. You put something on chat. Let's see what's on chat. Yes, I was referring to a case uh, that she did where she found it was okay to use the N-word in the workplace, that that wasn't a horrible, hostile work environment. And so when I read that (laughs) and juxtaposed it to how she characterizes her Black children, who are these victims that she saved from Haiti, you know, it's just horrible, right, To, to think of how those children, you know, what may be be done have been being done or is being done to their mindsets um so that's another horrible part i call every day every day is a new abnormal and we are not in post-traumatic stress syndrome the nation is in traumatic stress syndrome every day with different people acting in in different ways and um these uh, attacks by the these militia type people uh, where against the governor of, of right. Michigan, where I also read it's going to be rape. They're that they would have raped, raped her, right? The terrorists, right? They would have raped her. And, you know, <clears throat> if the president is reelected, we know those kinds of forces will feel even more empowered, literally, physically, to do certain things. And if he loses, they will also feel empowered in retaliation. So it's a a difficult era for for all of us. Thank you, Penny, for your kind remarks. Mm. I think we're at the hour, Rachel. I think we Sorry. are. Yeah. 
Well, thank you all. Thank you, my panelists. Thank you all for coming. Um, this has been great presentations. I really appreciate it. And Brenda, yes, you need to send us out your information about your book as soon as it's ready. I will do. And also, you know, there's lots of room up here in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'll be you're going to be many, many Americans are going to take you up on that. Seriously. Brenda. I, yeah, my friends and I have been thinking, how many people can we actually house? But just in the, you know, the world is a new outrage every day. It's been wonderful listening to you guys. It's uh, it's you a, real, too. a real honor to share the stage with you. And thank you to Rachel for organizing this, Rachel. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jess. Thank you, thank you to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.